Good evening, folks. Good evening. We thought that we would have an empty evening this evening with everybody else watching the England game. Oh, well, um, the England game's just finished, so that's why people... Oh, well, that's why <laughs> there's now going to be a big rush, no doubt, yeah. Well, I hope it won't affect your mood, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your mood doesn't depend on the uh, vigorousness of English players. Unless, of course, you're Danish. As always, we would love you just to pop something into the chat box saying where you're logging in from um, and also what sort of work you do. And if you've been on an SDS course before, so I'll just pop something into the chat box now to get you going. And of course, whether you've been to SDS Thursdays before, and if not, if it is your first Thursday, I really want to know how did you hear about us? because I did mention this particular Thursday in Research Digest text box. I don't know how many of you read Research. Actually, it'll be a very interesting question. Do you read Research Digest? It's a newsletter from the Psychologist magazine on the latest research. So interestingly, if you just mention, yes, I do read RD, or no, I don't, or I've never heard of it, because I advertise there quite regularly and who knows, maybe nobody who comes here ever reads it. So, yes. So how did you hear about us? And uh, also because tonight's topic will be the last Thursday before the summer break, we'll uh, give you all some time to recover and recuperate. I don't want to say to have some summer. We don't know whether we'll have summer or not. I am in a very whiny mood today, and I? Yeah, I should stop. And um, and just to uh, uh, to give some uh, us some time to uh, recuperate as well and come up with new topics. Uh, and today we've decided to go for a topic which is always popular. It's self-esteem. And uh, interestingly, despite the fact that Paul has been teaching on self-esteem for many, many years, the thing he'll be talking about, rock model of self-esteem today, uh, is uh, still very often a surprise for many practitioners. So that we've decided just to, to have a pure teaching session to give you something for free on self-esteem and uh, um, hopefully to to leave you for the summer break with a good positive attitude. Yes, I read Hardy. That's that's fantastic to see that people know uh, research digest because I do appear there quite well. We I do use uh, that text box very often. I don't appear there. It's our adverts appear there. Okay, while we're still gathering and we're still uh, hoping you to, to, to type in the chat box, I will as always share my screen with you and to uh, tell you a little bit about the courses which are on special offers because we've declared June the month of self-esteem, that's why we're doing this Thursday. And all our courses, recorded courses on self-esteem are on special offers. So I will show you how to find them. And for those who are watching us on YouTube later, first of all, hello, good to see you here. And secondly, of course, I will ask you as always to subscribe to our channel, to put the like to this video after you finished watching it, you don't need to do it in advance. And I will put in these two corners, I will put QR codes for SDS Seminars website and SDS Online website. So you can easily find the courses which I will mention uh, there. So for now, I'll share uh, my screen 
just to show you what courses are on special offers and maybe after tonight's topic you'll be interested in learning more on self-esteem. So uh, first of all I just wanted to mention to you that uh, SDS Thursday brought to you by SDS Seminars. We are a UK-based company teaching people uh, uh, who work in mental health, psychological skills of wide, wide range, but mainly specializing in CBT. Uh, this is our website, which is very easy to find. Just look for SDS Seminars UK and you'll find us straight away. And in order to check what free events we are offering, you go into the news and somewhere here, either in the first position or second or third position, usually in the first positions, you will see SDS Thursdays. So click here and you will see the list of SDS Thursdays. We are currently planned up to 21st of November. So you will see all the events and dates which we are planning to meet you uh, at this evening um, events. Uh, Today is the event on self-esteem and as I said, I want to show you the courses which are on special offers. First is self-esteem in adolescence and it is considerably discounted. It was a masterclass with Paul Grantham, which he ran just about three months ago. So it is very fresh. Uh, all the latest information is included here and if you work with children or adolescents or even if you work with adults lots of the things which are discussed at this masterclass uh, will be appropriate for your work and currently it is discounted by more than 60 pounds so self-esteem in adolescence is the first course which I wanted to recommend uh, building clients self-esteem uh, this is Paul's course which he ran quite a while ago but it is quite a basic course on self-esteem all the core information which you need to go which you need to know to work with this sort of clients is outlined is the, in this course and it's only 60 pounds at the moment so it is a fantastic offer for those who just want to get the essentials uh, of self-esteem work and the third course is working with low self-esteem again 60 pounds and this is a course which Paul ran within our certificate in working with non-diagnostic psychological problems so you can book this course on its own on, or you can go and book the whole certificate which is a BPS approved certificate and it covers a wide range of topics uh, which are all incredibly useful for everyday uh, mental health work from imposter syndrome to self-esteem to perfectionism to poor impulse control, working with rejection, working with guilt, overcoming doubt, working with jealousy and so on. All these things which come with clients into the room very often but do not fit specific diagnostic categories. And this course is also on special offer at the moment. So if you are interested in doing something broader than just self-esteem, please have a look at that course. It's fantastic. The courses are quite brief. So uh, they give gives you a fantastic uh, breadth of, of knowledge, breadth of techniques, and hopefully will be very helpful in your everyday work. I think uh, more or less we are all gathered tonight and I'll be very happy to introduce the founder of SDS Seminars and my co-director Paul Grantham. Paul please take it away. Uh, thanks very much Julia and uh, good evening folks. Um, again good evening thanks for being here. I hope the weather is um, as lovely where you are as it is here. I'm sort of saying that because uh, how long it's going to last of course is up for grabs. But I hope you're enjoying the evening anyway. Um, so um, we're going to be looking not at self-esteem generally. We are going to be looking 
at what I consider to be probably the single most important organizing idea around in the self-esteem field. Um, and in a, in a strange way, I'll say a little bit more about this obviously in a minute, but in a strange way, um, if you are dealing with this particular area, I just think this is a crucial starting point. So um, what I should also add, of course, is in the three um, trainings that uh, Julia's uh, just pointed out to you, this particular model typically tends to be the starting point of everything else that's actually in the training. Um, so um, let me just share my screen. Um, which way? Gone ahead a bit there, which hopefully you can fully see. Um, so, um, yeah, are you familiar with Mark's model of self-esteem? Let's, um, let's kick off with a brief straw poll, folks. Very simple straw poll here. Um, all you've got to say is yes or no. Um, but Julia's just going to pop a poll up uh, in the screen for us. Uh, do you actually have clients with low self-esteem? Yes, yes or no? Uh, just so I know what the broad balance is here. All right, we're still collecting, we're still collecting. Um, okay, so I'm going to end the poll at this particular point and share the results um, so you can actually see them. Um, so not universal, but um, overwhelmingly, um, it does seem that you actually do work with clients who have low self-esteem or, or, or self-esteem problems in some particular way. So um, not surprisingly, I guess I'm going to throw this back to you folks, which is if you all are working with, with clients who have these sorts of difficulties, um, what do you actually think it is? So you, you clearly have some confidence in knowing that your, your clients are suffering from low self-esteem. So I'd just be interested to know what your thoughts are about what that actually means. Um, so, you know, um, if you can just pop something in the chat box, folks, so I can see broadly uh, what, what, what you actually mean by this when you say that you have got clients uh, with low self-esteem. Um, Yes, uh, explore pride. Ah, oh, right, a whole range of things coming over now. Um, raft of behaviours that emerge and link back to confidence, self-doubt, questioning own self-worth, self-worth, self-respect, positive view of themselves. Um, I'm assuming that's for when it's positive self-esteem. Uh, perfectionist traits, uh, says Maggie. Uh, poor perception of self, low opinion of self. Don't believe they're good enough. Um, attachment, says Mel, uh, lack of trust and confidence, um, high comparison with others and seeing them as less than others. Um, okay, gosh, it's carrying on a defeatist mindset, possibly. Uh, lack of self-confidence and competence, uh, not knowledge of self, critical and judging of self, uh, questioning of all decisions they make, um, underlying sense of low self-worth. Um, so we've got quite a, quite a range there. Um, and obviously one of the sort of key um, sort of things that you've highlighted, it's not universal in what you've written down, but one of the key things that you've highlighted has something to do with this idea of low self-worth uh, that individuals actually have when we say that they've got low self-esteem. Um, I think that there's all sorts of interesting questions around in the self-esteem field. Um, you may have asked these of yourself or your clients already, um, but if you haven't, then I do think that they are worth reflecting on. Um, so is self-esteem different from confidence or is it the same? So is it possible to be a confident individual but to have low self-esteem? Um, is it possible to have self-worth, good self-worth, but actually not necessarily high self-esteem? 
Um, a perennial issue that tends to crop up periodically, I think, certainly with regards to folks that I supervise, um, is can you have too much of it? Um, and I guess there's this issue here about whether it potentially starts uh, blending in with something around the area of narcissism um, in some particular way. Does poor self-esteem cause problems or is it problems that cause poor self-esteem? Now, this is this is you might say, well, it's a bit of both, isn't it? Can I just say I think this is a really important question because in a way it helps to decide what the focus is of the work that we might do with our clients. To put it bluntly, if the client's existing poor self-esteem is related to their current difficulties, then if we focus on their current difficulties, then basically, and, and we are able to help them to address that, then um, there's the assumption that their self-esteem should automatically rise as a result. On the other hand, if, for instance, individuals have got problems that are related to pre-existing poor self-esteem, there's a couple, I guess, of implications of that. One of them will be that if you focus primarily on the presenting problem, um, then you may actually find you're not getting very far with your client. Um, or alternatively, um, it, it's a bit of a flash in the pan in, in terms of any change that actually occurs. Equally, one well, of the other implications of it is that um, actually we might be able to help people to directly address particular problems they have, whether they're emotional or behavioral or, or whatever, not by addressing the problem, but addressing their, their pre-existing low self-esteem. So it's quite an important, I mean, although it's sort of, you know, one immediately thinks, oh, it's a bit of both. It actually has some quite big implications for the sort of direction that we might go in with clients. Um, and what is it that makes a difference for the better for someone who, you know, for someone whose self-esteem isn't great, where we're trying to improve it or build on it in some particular way? Um, and can, and this is a really interesting question, and in many ways it's probably the primary reason why I'm running this evening, really, which is can trying to improve someone's self-esteem actually make things worse for them? And I actually believe that that's quite possible. And I think it's quite possible by um, not having a, a full understanding of really what self-esteem is actually about and what self-esteem is about for the particular individual we're working with. But in addition to that, at best, the things that we can be focusing on to help the individual enhance or grow their self-esteem totally misses the mark. Or alternatively, what it actually does is it potentially makes their problem worse. I'll come back with an example of this later on. So that, that's the reason why I think that this, this Merck model is um, just so central, really. It, 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 it's the, it should be the starting point, really, of anything that we're going to be doing with our clients where self-esteem is an issue. So um, if you're not familiar with Chris Merck, um, this is... Uh, him now he's still he's still teaching as a clinical psychologist um, in the Midwest in Ohio, um, and um, I, I think that probably um, his work has been some of the most influential in clarifying um, quite a lot of the research that's been done on self esteem. Um, yeah, I, I could say a lot more about that, but I'll, I'll leave that for the moment. So the key thing, this is the key thing I really want to drive home to you folks this evening. Self-esteem is not a unitary thing. It's not a unitary concept. It's actually a combination of two separate elements. One which is called worthiness or self-worth. And the other one is what might be broadly termed competence or self-efficacy. So um, let's just unpackage the difference between these so you have an understanding of them, first of all. So the whole issue about worthiness is about the general attitudes and beliefs that anyone has about themselves as a person. So it's, it's about the whole question of intrinsic worth. So in that respect, it, you know, when, we have, we, when we have a good sense of self-worth, 
We value ourselves intrinsically. We also accept ourselves, and that typically means that we are quite high on acceptance with regards to both our strengths and our shortcomings. It means, I guess, to use common parlance, that we're comfortable in our own skin and with who we actually are. And we value as well what we have as well as who you are. So in that respect, it has some implications for what are called social comparisons. Now, if you're not familiar with the idea of social comparisons, I, I sort of refer to this in quite a lot of my training, but I'll, I'll just briefly go through it now if you've not come across it. As human beings, we typically can constantly make social comparisons. We compare ourselves to others. And there are, first of all, some people that do this more than others. And there's some people that do it less. But the big divide is between people who make what are called upward social comparisons and people who make downward social comparisons. So upward social comparisons are where we compare or have the greater propensity to compare ourselves to people who we perceive as either better, more competent, or who possess more things than we do. And downward social comparisons are where we have individuals who have a tendency to compare themselves to people who are worse off than them. And in addition to that, have a tendency to value what they have and to selectively attend to that rather than to selectively attend to the things that they have not got, which they wish to aspire to. OK. Now, I'm not going to unpackage this in detail. All I'm going to say is at this particular point is we've got an enormous amount of evidence to indicate that people who make downward social comparisons on the whole tend to be much more psychologically healthy. Much more psychologically healthy. And generally speaking, people who have a good sense of self-worth typically make a lot of downward social comparisons or basically don't make too many social comparisons at all. OK. So this is all focused on attitude towards self. Now, this is quite different from competency. And competency is about the ability to do things. The ability to do things. And it's not just actually strictly speaking about the ability to do things it's about the belief that we have in our ability to do things and the degree to which we value them so in many many ways this concept is synonymous with confidence confidence based on competence so i'm someone who is competent in whatever field and I believe and have confidence in the fact that I will be successful in doing things that relate to that particular competence. And it also tends to mean that I am um, quite, um, it's quite important to me when I succeed at certain things because it gives me a good sense of self-pride. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of myself that I've managed to do things. So all tied up with the issue of doing. Now, um, this is where things start getting quite interesting because all human beings, to varying degrees, have different combinations of these particular factors. So they do, to some degree, feed on each other. So in that particular respect, if I think that, for example, I am... Um, deserving, I'm worthy, then I will probably feel that I'm going to be more likely to be able to achieve something. But it doesn't work in a perfect circle. So to some degree, these particular different things are actually separate. So we've got some individuals um, who can be broadly described as having a high sense of self-worth, and a high level of confidence and competence. And this is called classic high self-esteem. Um, and uh, you can see what I've actually put up there. 
Um, and then, of course, on the other side of the coin, uh, we have people who um, have a low sense of self-worth and a low sense of confidence and competence in being able to do things. And um, this is what we would historically call classic low self-esteem. Now, I think I'm sure for many of you, there are many clients that you might be working with that you can immediately see would, in a sense, fill that quadrant in some particular way with regards to their presentation and where they're actually at in their lives at this particular point in time. Um, and just so we're clear on that, then the implication of this is, is that attempting to address their sense of worthiness and attempting to address their sense of competence would be a useful thing to do because they clearly have difficulties to varying degrees in both of these areas. However, however, things get much more complicated when we look at the other quadrants. So in this bottom one, which is called defensive self-esteem two, what we actually have here is individuals who will be often very competent. Um, they will be quite highly skilled. They may also be incidentally very confident in terms of being able to do things. But their sense of self-worth is extremely low. So I've obviously got here Kurt Cobain and Van Gogh and Tony Hancock in each of their different ways, highly skilled individuals um, had, well, certainly I don't know about Van Gogh, but certainly Cobain and Hancock would have no problems going onto a stage and performing in front, in front of, of, of thousands of people or going onto um, a TV or into a stadium and performing in front of thousands so that, and, and doing what it is that they do and having confidence to actually do this. But quite clearly, their self-worth uh, basically is quite impaired. Um, so you also get, I don't know if you've come across this, because one of the other manifestations that may be less extreme than this that you might come across is that you might come across individuals who are very confident and competent in a particular area but somehow or other, it seems to be cut off from their sense of self-worth. So I've often come across this, for instance, in both adolescents and adults who, for example, excel in sports, for instance, where they will have a high level of competence, certainly within that particular area, but they don't like themselves. They don't think they've got any worth. That activity, bizarrely, doesn't have value for them in terms of what it means in terms of who they are as an individual. I've come across particularly adults who um, are often in quite senior positions who will be highly confident and highly competent in a range of areas. Um, but to caricature this to some degree, will return to home after work and will be sitting there alone feeling that everything's meaningless. So you've got this potential disconnect for some individuals. And what I guess I just wanna, I'll come back to this in a bit more detail in a minute, but obviously what I just want to emphasize at this point in time is trying to build such individuals self-esteem by building their confidence is gonna be a waste of time. In fact, for some individuals, it will actually amplify their sense of lack of self-worth. You know, what does this mean about me that I'm able to do all these things, but basically I still don't like myself? OK, so we'll come back to the implication of that in a minute. So uh, with defensive high self-esteem, we've got high on competence, low on perceived self-worth. And these are some of the different ways in which it can express itself. I've already mentioned feelings of unworthiness, but you can also find this expresses itself in things like poor self-care, poor self-nurturing, individuals who are, who, are, who are not looking after themselves, in inverted commas, I've already mentioned don't necessarily get satisfaction from achievements and have a tendency to overfocus on achievement behavior. Um, because you know, if this is something which builds, you know, if this is something which matches with my confidence, 
Um, and I feel I'm lacking in another area. It's not surprising that I go to the thing that I'm already good at and can gravitate towards. But it doesn't actually it doesn't actually help me. And indeed, it can compound the problem. So I should have mentioned this. So this you can get you can get people who become crazily over overly competitive, crazily over overly competitive, where you can find that um, you've got some individuals who become total workaholics. They're engaging in activity, and I hope you can also see, folks, how you'll get an overlap here with some particular mental health problems. So I can certainly see an overlap here, particularly, for instance, with anorexia, uh, with an emphasis on competitive, achievement-related, doing-type behavior, but where there's actually a big gap with regards to the sense of self-worth. Now, um, let's have a look at it from the other direction, which is defensive self-esteem one, which is, I think I'm okay, it's just I'm no good at anything new, okay? So Clive is someone I used to work with. You know, if you're sitting there thinking, who's Clive? Just somebody I used to work with um, as a client. And, and this is actually a quotation from him. Um, he, he, he was happy with himself. He was happy with himself. Um, he thought he was an okay person. Um, he didn't really, you know, question his, his intrinsic value. But he led a very prescribed life. So um, he would never try anything new. He would only do things which are familiar. Um, and the idea of change um, scared him in particular. Um, so, you know, in this sort of context, we have a slightly different set of issues. I think one of the, the things that tends to be top of the list here is fear of failure. Um, staying with the familiar. A lot of people, can I just point out, a lot of people can have very good sense of self-worth, but a low sense of self-efficacy or competence and live very, very happy lives. And they can often organize an environment for themselves where things are fine. I've used this term here, big fish in a small pond is, 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 is one particular thing that people do. But they do tend to find change threatening. And they tend to have a very prescribed, narrow repertoire of skills. And they find the idea of learning new skills or doing new things quite scary. So um, you can easily envisage uh, potential problems that crop up here for folks like this, which is that actually um, they are nice people. They like themselves. And then they are forced into a major change typically a life event, which requires them to adapt in their ability to do things. And that is where things start to collapse. Okay, so I hope you can see we've got an opposite problem here. You know, with working with someone like Clive, it would be a waste of time to lay a great deal of focus on encouraging him to accept himself. He has no major problems about accepting himself. His issue is about his perceived self-competence, about the ability to do things, if that makes sense. So there's a different, different issue there. Now, having said all of this, um, there is another thing that needs to be taken into account, which we're not going to be getting into in detail today, um, but which I do pick up on on some of the trainings which is what happens when you get defensive self-esteem one combining with lack of awareness. So I got three sort of common expressions of this. We start off with narcissism. I don't know how many of you have done the narcissism course with me, but broadly speaking, narcissism can be framed as a maladaptive way of trying to make yourself feel special. Um, and that is where you get certain problems occurring. You get other instances, which I personally think you're more likely to come across therapeutically, is what I've often termed deluded competency. So these are folks that think they're fine. Um, they're quite accepting of themselves, but also think that they're good at things, even when they're not. 
Um, and I've got uh, David Brent here from the office, which I know is getting a bit old now, but I just think he's as a as a character, he he just he just sums up this form of defensive self-esteem one, really. Um, and then we've got individuals, again, this is a, an ex-client of mine, who um, think that they're okay, um, but um, actually are very poor judges of situations and very poor judges of what they can do and achieve within certain situations. And what you often get here is increased risky behavior. I'm using the term quite broadly here, by the way, but behavior is basically a poor judger of risk um, in terms of the different things that they do, okay? Now, all of these folks have a bit of a tendency to blame others for their difficulties. Um, so, you know, when they are confronted by, in a peculiar way, their incompetence in a particular area, if we can use that, that, that terminology, how do they make sense of it they have a general tendency to externalize it and blame it on others. So get a couple of things just I want to say about this, which I hope are pretty self-evident, but which do need to be emphasized. These folks do not need to be taught to accept themselves more. In fact, this is probably one of the most dangerous things to be doing. You know, I, I, that is not where the issue lies. And indeed, the great danger is, and I have seen this in a number of instances, is it can push such people into more narcissistic behavior. If the overall focus is on increasing their self-acceptance, getting them to see themselves as being a good, valuable person, and so on and so forth. Um, so what these folks need is they need to find a way of, on the one hand, stopping externalizing the causation for their problems. Um, and secondly, in addition to that, to be willing to embrace the need to basically increase their self-efficacy. So what they, what they need is a willingness to both recognize and engage in something which will build their confidence and build their competency. Um, and that, that's a whole, whole big area, which I, I'm not gonna have really time to get into, but which I just sort of wanted to touch on because people, it, it sort of in some ways answers that question, which I raised right at the beginning, which is can people have too much um, high self-esteem? And, and it, it, the very brief answer to this is it, it really depends on how it's being presented in the person. Um, but certainly you can have individuals who think that they are absolutely wonderful, um, but actually have a relatively impaired level of competency. And what they certainly, they, they don't need any more encouragement to basically um, accept themselves in, in, in any way. So um, how do you assess this? Um, again, we go into more detail on this, particularly, can I hasten to add, um, in the longer of the two of the three um, uh, training courses. Um, I think half of the problem, by the way, with regards to the tendency to, first of all, see self-esteem as being related solely to self-worth and also why it's led to some confusing research results um, is because it's over-reliance, basically, it's over-reliance um, on Rosenberg's self-esteem scale. Um, and that, that, unfortunately, is still commonly being used. It's almost exclusively related to, to self-worth. Um, I think the CAP is a far better um, scale to actually use because it does pick up on, um, basically, the... Um, the, the sort of self-efficacy, competence, confidence side of things, as well as the issue of self-worth and worthiness. So um, I think we're nearly at the end here um, before I sort of throw things open for questions, folks. Um, but what I just really wanted to say is, number one, you do need to have some idea of the relative difficulties that any one client has that you've got sitting in front of you regarding where they broadly sit 
within these four different quadrants. Okay. Um, and that in turn should determine the relative balance of the types of intervention that you use. So what I've just got here are some very brief descriptions um, of, um, of, of, of these particular things. Um, I'm not going to unpackage them here. Um, again, come along on the course if, if, if you're interested in this. But if we look at the worthiness based interventions, then un undoubtedly valuing, having a valuing therapeutic relationship is going to be central. Um, the fundamental reality is, is that typically we only learn to value ourselves if we've had the experience of being valued. Now, people's sense of value um, can dip temporarily according to the circumstances that they're currently in. But it can also, of course, be a pre-existing state as well. And that's got some implications, I would suggest, coming back to one of those other questions that I asked at the beginning of this evening, which is, you know, do you work with the problem or do you work with the underlying self-esteem? To some degree, this addresses that. Um, because the reality is, is that in both instances, a valuing therapeutic relationship is a central component to it. But if you have quite high levels of pre-existing self-esteem, um, I am going to stick my neck out here, folks, and say that it is not going to be sufficient to see the therapeutic relationship as being sufficiently correcting in some particular way. There's a whole range of reasons for that, which I'm quite happy to, to maybe pick up in the discussion after I've finished, if we've got time, but I won't get into now. Secondly, on the worthiness side of things, um, there are a whole range of cognitive interventions that are usable, but please do not notice what the focus should be. The focus should be on unhelpful thinking and beliefs that are related to how I believe about myself as a person. So if we were talking about this in terms of negative core beliefs, we would be talking about believing that I have no intrinsic worth and probably in addition to that, something along the lines that I'm unlovable. But these are obviously all key beliefs about intrinsic self-worth. Thirdly, the ability to provide and receive positive feedback um, from self. Um, we obviously naturally come to believe the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Um, but equally, we have a tendency to believe the feedback that we give ourselves about things um, and who we actually are as a person, much more than the feedback that we get from other people. So in that respect, what you'll often find is individuals are not telling themselves about their intrinsic value or why they have intrinsic value, which is a reasonable question to ask. You know, why should I see myself as having some sort of intrinsic value? So there are a whole range of interventions which are focused on that. And the last one I just want to highlight, which I just know from past experience um, in both, well, in all settings, really, though actually I say all settings, not so much in therapy second settings, but certainly in training and supervision settings is the one that people have the biggest difficulty with, which is that we've got a lot of evidence indeed that self-care and self-enhancement increases sense of self-worth. So self-care is basically maintenance type stuff, or to put it another way, it's looking after your body. So that's about, you know, feeding yourself properly. It's about exercise. It's about washing and cleanliness. It's, a, it's about treating your body as something that needs to be looked after and is something which deserves to be looked after. Self-enhancement is different and is often the area which is, is more controversial, which is basically boils down to making the best of what you've got. And that actually, this is about enhancing the way we look. So I am not incidentally here, just in case any of you were wondering, I'm not talking here about cosmetic surgery. 
what I am talking about here fundamentally are things like use of clothing, hairstyle, and certainly for a number of people, use of makeup as well. And if you want to come along to, to listen to that particular section on the training events, um, I, I talk about some, some interesting case studies where we've worked with people specifically to build their self-esteem through self-enhancement, through the use of hairdressing, through the use of clothing, and also as well through use of makeup. Um, a lot of people want to dis discard it. They say it's superficial. All I can say is, is I suspect every single one of us here feels differently about ourselves when we clothe ourselves in a different way. Obviously, I can't do a lot with my hair. Um, but what I can say is, is the way I feel about myself is fundamentally different when I shave versus don't shave, for instance. Um, and that these have, a, have an impact in terms of self-esteem. Moving across to the competent self-efficacy stuff, um, we know that goal setting of any sort is extraordinarily powerful at developing confidence. I'll say a little bit more about this when we come on to one of the longer trainings, but we, for instance, know that in people over the age of 65, individuals who continuously goal set for themselves and can i just say this doesn't have to be you know i, I oddly enough I, I know someone who um was very proud of themselves told me recently that for his 65th birthday um he had gone and climbed everest um with with a friend um i should hasten to add they didn't climb the whole of everest but they went they went above base camp anyway and he, he, he got a great kick out of that. I'm not saying that you have to have big goals like that. My parents, for instance, in their 70s, um, used to get a real kick, for instance, out of driving to different supermarkets that they hadn't been to before. And just the goal of finding it, getting in there, discovering it, finding their way around. So when I use the term goal setting here, you know, this doesn't have to be big goals, but it does, it is something here about continuous self-challenge and doing new things in some way. Role modeling, um, basically the confidence to go and do something is substantially dependent in many instances on whether we have a positive role model for it. And um, I go through some of the ways in the training in which clients can discover um, pre-existing role models that they've actually got who can be helpful and useful. Cognitive interventions have another role here as well, but I hope you notice here that the focus is different. So the focus here is on unhelpful beliefs regarding the ability to do things. The most common is the one I've already mentioned, which is failure belief, um, or, or it, it, it's sort of um, younger, younger cousin, which is if ever I try and do anything new, it will never work. Um, but but those, those, those beliefs about doing things. Receiving feedback from third parties on performance and competence um, is also quite important. And it is one of the areas, can I say, where I actually think that at the end of the day, um, therapists can make a big difference. And finally, two things just to mention, problem solving skills. Um, I haven't got time to go into this in a lot of detail, but the ability to problem solve is absolutely fundamental when dealing with new challenges that you've got no prior experience of. And influencing skills, which historically would have been called assertiveness training, but which I think is much broader than that. So I'm going to leave that at that point, folks. There are some other in important differences which we, which we come on to in the training, but I hope it gives you a flavour and I hope that whatever it is that you're going to be doing with your clients, you at least try and hold in mind that distinction between competence, self-efficacy and confidence and self-worth and self-value. And think about what it is that you're doing and which of those particular areas are being fundamentally uh, and primarily being addressed. So I will... Um, I'll leave things at this point. I don't know if there are any questions, Julia, or if, if folks want to, to raise their hands and, and jump in at all. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, 
there were some questions which I want very briefly to address, but before I go uh, into questions, I just wanted to mention that this presentation will be available to you for free on our YouTube channel. So if you want ever to come back and to listen to it again and see the slides and check something, uh, you can always go onto our YouTube channel and um, and listen to it again. And of course, as I always say, subscribe and please comment because comments are very important for uh, pushing the YouTube channel higher in the algorithms. Just a couple of very brief questions, Paul, because I just want to say to, to everyone that um, if you want to know more, obviously this was just one part of uh, self-esteem training, which Paul does. Do use any of the three courses which I recommended. And also there was a question about jealousy and self-esteem. Again, it's perfectly addressed in the module on, on jealousy. It's only two hours, so you can purchase it and watch it very quickly and have your um, questions answered. Of course, as always, there was a question about autistic clients and where do they sit? How do they fit into this MRAC model of self-esteem? Can they be represented in all four corners of the model or they tend to be in one or two particular ones, Paul? Um, I think that there is um, there are issues that can crop up in all four, can I say? Um, or that's not the right way of putting it. It, it. There are issues that can crop up in in the three that are are where where problems actually arise. Um, I do think it varies, um, but I don't think it's possible to make a definitive statement purely on the basis of the fact that the person's autistic. So um, undoubtedly, I've certainly worked with autistic clients where their sense of self worth is very impaired. Um, but um, where their sense of competence is quite high. Can I just, you know, I, I, I mentioned something briefly about, um, about social comparisons, but can I just say, you know, there's no easy way of getting away from it that our sense of self-worth is partly dependent and always has been dependent on the attitude of others around us. So to make a very obvious point here, if people do not around us, do not treat us as having value, then not surprisingly, we are more prone to having low self-worth as a result. So in that respect, for some autistic folk, not all, but for some autistic folk, there are instances where basically, for want of a better term, lack of social acceptance or social rejection, um, does have an impact in that particular way. And as is the case with all of these things, depending on the length of time over which it's occurred, people end up internalizing this in some instances. Mm -hmm. Equally, can I say, I've also come across folks who are autistic, who will be in that top right-hand corner as well. Um, and um, there we have a different set of problems. So I, I, I'm a bit loath to see, to be honest with you, I'm a bit loath to see autism as having a categorical impact mm. in some particular way. It's part of the, of the overall mix of who an individual is. And in, in that respect, it's no different from anybody else, I think, you know, and, and it can contribute to problems, but not necessarily. Yes, yes, I, I, was, I was hoping that you will reply like that because Whenever you think of autistic individuals, they can very well fit in any of the four corners and sometimes jump from one to another, just like every other person can. Yes. Can I just add one further thing? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a broad point to actually make, which um, I think crops up quite a lot, which you've just got to be careful about. The degree to which one explains any individual according to a single characteristic. And I have noticed this quite commonly, certainly in supervisees, where if someone has been diagnosed as autistic and there is a particular presentation or issue, there is a natural inclination to attribute it to their autism. 
Mm -hmm. All I would want to emphasize is the point I've just made, really, which is undoubtedly it has an impact for some people in some areas, but it's not the only explanatory concept for an individual's behavior or emotions or experience if they are autistic. Yes. As, as it's not for any, there's no single you know, factor that explains any one person's behavior or, or experience. Sorry, yeah. I just, just... No, no, I think, thank you for saying on. this. I think it is uh, very true and very insightful because, and it, uh, it, and it actually goes for any diagnosis which okay. we will uh, give our clients and we can't explain everything in their life with no. that particular diagnosis. People are much more complex than that. So yes, uh, that's all we have time for tonight. I will ask you to write, if you haven't done so, to write a few words in the chat box, please. So I could probably use it to promote future Thursdays. If you found it useful, if you hated it, don't bother. That's okay. <laughs> so, so I hope you, uh, uh, you will have a good summer and uh, we'll see you again. Let me just see when are we meeting again. I think it's end of August we are meeting. Uh, so I'll see you then let me see because oh 5th of september 5th of september the next thursday please put it in your diaries 5th of september thank you very much and uh, you can unmute yourself and say your goodbyes it would be good to hear your voices and take care bye bye thank you Love yourselves, folks. thank you very much thank, thank you, you very much thank you bye-bye take care look thank after yourselves you. bye. 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 Bye.